Ladies and gentlemen, get the book Dr. Joshua Bowen wrote, The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament. It is extremely full of knowledge and information for anyone, as well as join the Patreon. There's hundreds of videos that have been not released to the internet. You can ask questions and I will record them with these scholars in high definition. I do that all the time. You can also personal message me and you help the community grow. Thanks a lot. Megan Lewis, welcome back once again. I'm excited to hear what you have to say about this because I heard it before somewhere. Uh, <laughs> the oldest known writing of any woman in history, mm -hmm. we, we have no older data that women have wrote. Uh, tell us about this lady and what is, what is it, where is it? Yeah. So the earliest female author that we know of uh, is a priestess called Anne Joanna, and she was the daughter of Sargon the Great of Akkad, who was the first person to unite northern and southern Mesopotamia. Uh, he created the first world empire, um, and he installed his daughter Anne Joanna in the high priestess ship of the city of Or. So she was the high priestess of the moon god Sin, uh, but a personal kind of devotee of the goddess Ishtar. And the writings that we have from her are um, hymns and poems to the goddess Ishtar, um, extolling her, her virtues and her glory and, and how great and magnificent she is. Um, and they're really, really cool, essentially. Um, I will have a, like put a quick caveat in here. All of the uh, copies of these texts that we have come from a much later time period. They're all attributed to Enhe Duana, um, but we don't have anything like that she wrote in her hand, essentially. Um, so it can be debated whether or not she did actually compose these. Um, but for me, even if historically she didn't put stylus to clay, as it were, the fact that she's remembered by later traditions as having written this quite extensive corpus for, for one individual um, is actually really, really interesting because it tells us that A, women could write, B, that it was considered socially acceptable for them to write, um, which is, is fascinating. And we see also, uh, so Enhe was in like 2300 BCE, very roughly. Um, I'm not great with dates, so I'm, <laughs> I'm rounding to give you a, a rough idea of Second what we're millennium. talking about. Yeah. Um, well, uh, uh, late third millennium. Okay. Um, so. But so she's a, pri a priestess and a princess, so obviously very wealthy, very high social status. Um, so her being educated isn't isn't terribly surprising if you think about it. We have other princesses, other priestesses later in Mesopotamian history who write, who do their own kind of uh, accounting, um, keep their own records. So that's that's not wildly surprising. And Hiduan is particularly cool because she's the first like literary author. Um, but you also have in, um, I think, around 2600 BCE, um, you have evidence for women of a non-royal class, so merchant women. So still wealthy, uh, not as wealthy, not as uh, high up in the social standing, um, but women who could write and could read. Um, so this is from a, a city in um, Turkey, what was then, or what is often referred to as Anatolia. Um, so in southern Turkey, a city called Karnash, uh, there was a, a merchant colony of Assyrian traders. Um, so Assyria is like northern Mesopotamia. Um, they traveled up to Karnash, they brought with them tin and textiles, and they trade them for silver, and then send the silver back down south to to Mesopotamia. Um, and this goes on for a while and a couple of generations. And ultimately what you have is the men of a family going up, settling in Karnesh, um, like staying there and running that side of the business. And then their wives are staying home in Asher with their children, running their own uh, areas of expertise. They were the ones generally who oversaw the weaving, made the textiles that were, their husbands then took up uh, to Anatolia. But what we have are letters from these women that they send to their husbands um, about business matters, but often asking them, when are you coming home? Um, you haven't been to the temple in years. You have to come and pay respects to your God. You need to come home and take care of your children. There are things we have to do that we can't do without you, like rituals and, and ceremonies, marriage uh, specifically. Um, 
we need you to come home. So those are, I mean, they're fascinating because it provides a really nice kind of window into personal life um, in Mesopotamia. And, and we often don't have a lot of that. Much of what we have historically, not just from Mesopotamia, from, from Egypt as well, um, much of what we have is like royal official court documentation, which is interesting just in its own right, but it doesn't often give you very much of an idea of how people like you and I would have lived. Um, so these letters really give that, that kind of insight. Um, and they're made even more interesting for me by the fact that um, the men who went up to Ashur, uh, to Karnesh quite often would marry uh, local Anatolian women and maintain separate families um, from their like original Assyrian family. Um, um, so, yeah, interesting stuff. The men were just... I, I guess in a, in the society, women seem to have had a higher value, at least, than what you would see typically, biblically speaking, in yeah. a patriarchal society. So it's somewhat patriarchal? It, so it's definitely still patriarchal. Women are still um, under the control, under the purview of a specific man, be it their husband, their father, their brother, or their uncle. Um, the way you, you kind of see women working around this when they enter the the enter religious service and enter the priesthood, um, then often they have a bit more freedom and you do see priestesses owning their own land and, and stuff like that. Um, but no, generally speaking, women in Mesopotamia were closely, closely tied to uh, a familial male figure. Um, but they do also have certain freedoms that you wouldn't necessarily expect, maybe. Women typically are in charge of things like uh, breweries. Um, they own pubs. That's like not a male-dominated thing, that the women own the pubs. And you see that in the Epic of Gilgamesh, if you've ever read through it. Um, when Gilgamesh comes to the end of the world, there's a pub there, because, I mean, why wouldn't there be? And <laughs> the tavern keeper is a female. Um, and that's just all of them, as far as I'm aware, that we have record of, they're all women. Um, so women, they brew the beer, they're in charge of the taverns, um, and they're in charge of things like textile weaving, which doesn't like seem like that big a thing, but it's a massive financial um, aspect of family life. Um, and they're often like in charge of the house, and that like when you say they're in charge of the house, that doesn't seem all that important, but that means they're in charge of things like day-to-day -day finances and making sure that the family business runs correctly while their husbands are away doing whatever it is husbands do. Um, and like managing, I, did I say managing accounts? I feel like uh, I did. Just money, mainly. Yeah. But like generally managing everything. And that's, that's a pretty big responsibility. Hmm. Sounds like you could argue, and, and I'm bringing this to the Bible just a smidge, mm -hmm. to say like in Proverbs, the Proverbs 31 woman is kind of doing the managing, going mm -hmm. to the gates and things. So there could be something there. Uh, but can you tell us a little bit of the drama a little more about that? Because who doesn't like to hear about the drama? The wife is writing and... Did, do they even know? Do some of them in the, do we have evidence? I mean, the best way to ask is, do we have evidence of some of them knowing that they have another family somewhere else? So it's been a while since I looked at the letters, but I, I think they all knew. Um, I think that would be a pretty difficult thing to hide. And I'm very willing to be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that they they knew. And, like, it's not... I don't imagine anyone was particularly thrilled with the situation, mm -hmm. but I don't think it would be terribly surprising um, because this is something you see culturally throughout that region in this historical period. And I mean, you see it in the Bible, Abraham has two wives and then he, he has sex with his wife's handmaid and like, it happens. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's legal, it's socially permissible for that kind of thing. Um, I think the, and I'm not a legal expert, but I believe that the legality gets, um, it gets interesting because I believe the man has to make sure he can provide for his original family. Um, and if he can't, then then he runs into trouble. Um, but no, it, I don't think it would have been a secret. Wow. Uh, and you said that they would write stuff like, hey, we need some money. What's yeah. up? Yeah, yeah. So the women, so like I said, they're, they're weaving the textiles. They're going by donkey up to Anatolia, which is like a long way. It's, it's not close. 
which is why these men had to go up and stay there essentially for years at a time because it, it took several months to travel back and forth. Um, so they'd send up the textiles, they'd send up their letters, um, and because they're in charge of things like essentially running the house, running the family in a asshole while their husbands are away, they need money for food, they need money for oil, um, just keeping their life going, repairing the house. And they're also the point of contact for any business associates still in Assyria. So you've got people coming to their door demanding that they pay their debts or their husband's debts. Mm. Um, so these women are obviously writing to their husbands saying, look, you didn't send us enough money. I've got this guy coming at me for money for God knows what. I need to buy more oil. We don't have any, um, any grain left and we don't have any flour left. You need to send more money down. Final thing, um, in some of these letters you brought up in the past video that we somehow magically lost, that um, they might mention stuff like, this guy's harassing us. Yeah. Now, have there been any letters where it's gone further and then more detail in saying like, this guy took advantage of me or like, uh, there's been like real serious situations occur that you know of? I honestly don't know. Um... It's an interesting question, though, yeah. just because, I mean, men are more, like, especially in antiquity, I suspect, are more physically, and even today we could see this happen, like, their size is different, but that men might take advantage of the fact that they know the husband's out mm -hmm. of town, and they're taking advantage of the situation. I kind of wonder if there's some, like, sneak peek window into some of this. I don't know. That's a really good question. I have to read the letters again and have a look. I just look at the world around today. It's like, <laughs> if you look around, you can see it happens all the mm -hmm. time today. Why wouldn't it have happened yeah. in antiquity? Especially when the husband's been gone for years mm -hmm. and he has a whole family. He's mm -hmm. got somewhere else. This woman here has nobody, mm -hmm. and or at least other than the kids that she's raising. Uh, made me think maybe that's something there. I don't know. Thank you. Of course.